HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Welcome to Inside Julia's Kitchen, the podcast of the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. I'm your host, Todd Shulkin, the Foundation's Executive Director. Our show takes you inside the Foundation's world to meet the talented people we have the great fortune of learning from all the time. On today's show, we welcome food writer Hillary Dixler Canada. In this episode, we'll talk to Hillary about restaurants in 2024. Eaters' worldwide recommendations, and we'll hear Hillary's Julia moment. Stay with us, we'll be right back. As always, we launch the conversation with an inspiration from Julia. Julia loved dining out, going all the way back to her lunch at La Corone, the one that changed her life and ignited her passion for food. Julia has always valued restaurants. In her beloved Santa Barbara, where she lived out the final years of her life and the foundation is headquartered, Julia dined out often and is well remembered among its restaurant chefs and proprietors. While Julia's interest tended to be chef-centric, her advocacy for chefs inherently helped the public value their restaurants. As we talked a lot about during the COVID-19 pandemic, restaurant closures helped many of us realize just how much they contribute to building community beyond merely serving food. Someone with a similar enthusiasm for restaurants, the place they hold in our hearts and in our global communities, is Hilary Dixler Canavan. Hillary is the author of the restaurant-inspired cookbook, Eater, 100 Essential Restaurant Recipes, which was published by her friends at Abrams last year. Her own love for restaurants was honed eating in her native New Jersey's iconic diners and red sauce joints and as a fan of food television. After working her way up in New York City's restaurant world, she, up until very recently, spent 10 years at Eater, the last five, as its restaurant editor. During her tenure, Eaters become a go-to national as well as local resource for engaged diners. Hillary has helped Eater expand the scope of its national coverage and led major initiatives like its Best New Restaurant list. Those credentials make her the perfect guest for our almost annual tradition, covering restaurant trends for the year to come. Welcome to the podcast, Hillary. Hi, thank you for having me. We're excited to to talk restaurants for the whole show. Yeah, me too. So before we talk about Eaters Covered specifically, I just sort of, you know, just given your breadth of experience, kind of get your your own and, and, you know, speaking really personally, not as any kind of official representative or anything, but just with your own knowledge, what your take on just how the restaurant industry is doing in 2024, you know, we, you and I both live in Los Angeles. And to me, it seems like there are still really significant closures happening right and left here. Do you feel like, is that what you're hearing or seeing a across the country or certain parts better or worse than others? Yeah. I don't want to imply that everything is doom and gloom, but one of the things I have been telling my 
former colleagues and in my chats with folks within the industry is really like I anticipated um, starting in like 2021 when restaurants started reopening, I thought we would have at least three years of like chaos. Um, Mm -hmm. And I still believe that that analysis and assessment holds that I think we will continue to see the final ripples and gasps of what happened during COVID playing out in the restaurant space. And what I mean by that really is for the restaurants that were able to survive shelter in place, reopenings, closings, all of that, think about, so for the restaurants that survived, a lot of them did so by accruing enormous debt. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, that's debt that might've been pre-existing when the pandemic started that then continued as um, profits for 2020, especially, and then into 2021 were not what had been expected. Um, So I think in 2024, we're going to see those final gasps of if your business has hung on this long, I believe that we're going to see 2024 as a make or break year. Part of that too, is that the dining trends for consumers have started to normalize, or if you want to use the favorite food writer expression, new normalized, mm. where, you know, there was a real spike in dining out in 2021 and into 2022. By 2023, things had settled a bit and they settled lower than where they had been in 2019. So the like the net effect of the pandemic, one of the one of the net effects of the pandemic for consumers is that they're just dining out a bit less than they used to. And that has an impact on restaurants, bottom line, of course. Yeah. Can we talk about that paradox? Because on the one hand, it makes sense to me, but I think especially maybe if you live in, in, in a major city, it still seems like it's harder to get a restaurant reservation. It's harder to get into restaurants. When you go to them, they often are, are very full but it seems to me that 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 it, it's creating a misperception e- either because restaurants are actually open less and or there are actually fewer. What, what from your chair, like, how do you describe that? I don't want to cite a statistic that I don't have um, proper data backing, but I will say I believe there are actually still fewer independently owned and operated restaurants than there were, say, in 2019. One of the things I noticed when we were working on Eater's Best New Restaurants list for 2023, I was surprised that in some ways that list was easier to put together in 2022. That in 2023, I noticed in multiple cities across the country, there was some caution and some conservatism in new business investment. And again, I think that is part of What I was talking about, about this new normal of slightly less dining, of restaurants operating with significant debt and restaurant operators taking a beat to be like, hmm, can I sustainably open right now? Is that good business practice? Yeah, I was going to ask you what, from the restaurant point of view, from restaurant tours that you've talked to, what are they doing or what are they telling you they're doing to adapt and survive? I mean, we talked a little bit about the change in operating hours. Have you, have you heard and seen other things or maybe even interesting things that you hadn't expected that seems to be becoming a a trend amongst restaurateurs? Yeah, there were a few pre-existing trends that I think were accelerated by these, uh, by the impacts of the pandemic. For example, really ever since Danny Meyer hit it, so profoundly huge with Shake Shack, there's been an interest with from what I call like restauranty people, you know, like chefy Mm -hmm. chefs to Mm -hmm. expand into fast casual or some call it fine casual. There has been because of the uh, impacts of the pandemic. So the increased reliance on delivery, um, smaller staff needs, even more interest in creating expandable, scalable, quick service brands. And I've seen positive expansion, positive growth for chefs and restaurant operators in that space um, in the last year. So I think that's one way chefs have adapt- restaurant owners and chefs have adapted is to put their effort and energy towards their 
their concepts that can operate with smaller staff. Um, mm. So that's one thing. I think the there's an an answer that wants to be given around QR codes and kiosks, but those like bum me out. So I don't want that to be, <laughs> I don't want that to be the takeaway because I don't like it. <laughs> Which like makes me feel like, is it because I'm getting older or is it just because I am a sentimental sap who likes other humans, you know, but I don't go to restaurants to feel alone and I do worry that QR codes and kiosk service like increases our alienation from each other, not to be too high minded. about. It. For sure. Restaurants are really, as I said at the top of the show, they're really about community. And once you're pushing everything from no personal ac- interaction and you're working with a robot, which I've noticed is a very big trend in, in airports now mm-hmm. where they're, which I think is about cost of labor, but it's Absolutely. still, I think to your point though, it it's demotivating. If you know that all you're going to do is punching into another screen and then getting something delivered by a robot, well, maybe you'll actually make your own sandwich before you go to the airport. Yeah, it's really a bummer. And one of the things I think about with QR codes, especially at sit down restaurants, and I've I've at least in my like anecdote data of my own dining out, this has been phasing away, but there was, especially at the beginning, at the end of 2022 into 2023, there were still like sit down restaurants that were kind of QR code menu first. And you had to ask for printed menus. The thing that really gets to me with that is like our phones are so sticky and the tech giants who make our phones and the apps on them they live to make you look at your phone and they are really good at it. So for a restaurant to like make us take our phones out to look at the menu, it takes a lot of willpower to then put your phone back in your pocket. And I say that with like empathy, like it's hard for me too. like, there is so much on our phone. It's like, I don't know. It's like what Bo Burnham, it's everything, you know, a little bit of everything all of the time is the internet. Right. And like, it's right there. And so for a restaurant to ask you to like access the everything portal and then put it away, I think it's just setting up your dinner for interruption from the jump, which again, bums me out. Um, so yeah, that's one trend where, like I said, I think that is, it's just happening. There are, especially in the like most quick of quick service settings, like fast food airports, you know, an increase in machine learning and tools like QR codes and kiosks to um, eliminate staff. Yeah, no, I know. And it'd be interesting to see if that, you know, trend. uh, Yeah. I mean, there is a certain somewhere there's the limit of self-service, like in some ways, Mm self-service is nice. And it's funny, like moving, I lived abroad in the UK for almost a decade and coming back to California, in no part of Europe does anyone bag groceries for you. Um, and partly that goes back to exactly what we're talking about. The labor is too expensive. They just wouldn't do it. And it's not been the norm. So, you know, particularly, I, I think it's common in the States. It varies a little bit. But in California, most of the grocery stores still have paid staff who bag groceries. Mm-hmm. But when you get used to doing it yourself, you do not want the crap job some teenager does <laughs> when you get home. <laughs> So I'm so type A about it. Yeah, you know? exactly. I also feel like if you're a person who has, has any sort of brain for like, not even a brain for systems, but I don't know. I just think of type A. If you're a type A person, you're just going to want to do it yourself. Cause I'm like, I keep all the cold stuff together. I, you know, and I have the produce together and the pantry stuff together so that unloading it is easier. Anyway, your audience does not care about my grocery bagging. No, I'm sure they're enjoying your your analysis of my habits. <laughs> I'm sure that will be amusing many family and friends. So well, I'm going to change the subject. Then. So you kindly brought up the you were calling the new normalization. And I was just curious. And, and you started to talk about that, which I thought was really interesting. Your sort of three years of chaos prediction. Oh, mm-hmm. So um, which I certainly cannot contest. Uh, um, I'm glad you were only saying three years and that yeah. I think you were saying that 
you know, buckle your seatbelts 2024 is g- you're going to continue to likely be disappointed by favorite restaurants closing mm-hmm. or changes and that at best it'll be 2025. So looking into your crystal ball, mm-hmm. um, do you have any sort of forecast of by, and I'm not asking you for a specific date or anything, but where this new normal will be? And I think what I mean by that is we were just talking about the rise of more quick serve and fast casual things. Mm-hmm. Is that a trend to come? Well, I think we talked a lot about on this show during the pandemic was fine dining going to disappear or is it just too expensive and it won't be as common as it used to? Or will we also end up with this really polarized thing where all we have is fine dining and fast casual? Yeah, I think I certainly don't think fine dining is going away. I think your ladder hypothesis is closer to what I see, but I also, maybe I'm just an optimist. I don't think we're going to totally lose that middle. Um, but like so much else in our culture and economy, that divide between high and low continues to grow. And that's happened at restaurants too, where like the surest paths to success are either at the bottom or at the top. Um, Cause if you think about the highest end fine dining, it's almost recession proof. There are always fabulously wealthy people. You know, I think about the great recession of 2008 and it's like Macy's had trouble but Bloomingdale's was okay. And there's an element of that in the restaurant world too. There will always be fabulously wealthy people who can afford to take vacations and dine at hundred, you know, hundreds of dollars a plate tasting menus. Um, and their, their bubble of like elite wealth, I think is not, necessarily in danger. I think the restaurants that struggle more are that like upper mid range where you're looking at a few hundred dollars for two people to eat. You know, you're looking at entrees between 25 and $60. So it's a big night out for a regular family, a huge night out. That's where I think, you know, that's the restaurant that I think has been at the most risk. One trend I'm seeing, and again, I, 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 I mentioned this before, but some of these trends pre-existed the pandemic, and it's just that it's almost like sad natural selection of like the trends that won the pandemic are now the ones that have like the space to flourish. One of the big trends is chainification and restaurants going from, say, one or two locations to firmly establishing themselves as chains. So one of the examples that's right at the top of my mind right now is Call Your Mother. It was a deli and bagel shop that started in D.C. I had put it on our best new restaurant list for 2019. They do wood fire bagels. Really, um, the, the aesthetic is very saved by the bell. It's a very cool deli and sandwich shop. They started expanding in DC and now they have locations in DC and Colorado. And I believe there's a third state, maybe Virginia on their, um, you know, locations list. And that to me is like happening at multiple levels where one of the paths forward is to create a, is, is to invest in restaurants that are repeatable, um, And so I'm thinking of Call Your Mother. I'm thinking Carbone from the major food group. There's a lot of Carbones now, including like in Dallas. Um, I'm thinking about here within LA, I think a real trailblazer with that is Ludo and Petit Trois, John and Vinny's, Kismet Rotisserie. You know, some of these independent operators have really leaned into just repeat. Well, and sorry, I have to go back to something. Did you just reference Saved by the Bell, the television show? Uh, I that did. Was for, okay, I got, I got that. So Saved by the Bell references, did they have like a diner-esque kind of part of their plot line? Is that what you're referencing? What no, is, like what, the, what, what does that describe? <laughs> sorry, like the visuals. Like when you think of like the Saved by the Bell intro, like the squiggles and the like saturated neon colors, the aquas, the hot pinks, the purples, the little dots, the squiggles, triangles, just the aesthetic. Got it. Love it. 
I, the look I, of, I, of Saved by the Bell. Got it. No, and that that's interesting, too, because actually that is something that I found was more prevalent in when I lived in London, where there are these local chains, but they sort of defy the, the, the kind of stigma of chains that mm-hmm. their food is very high end. It's some it's as good as anything else you can get. But there are multiple one I'm thinking of in, in London. I think it's only in London. They might have a couple in other, but it's called Gales and it's a bakery. Gales has some of the best croissants and they have a cinnamon roll that nobody else can do. And they make sandwiches and all that, but they're essentially just a coffee place. And there's one in every neighborhood. Now they skew, they're all in the higher end neighborhoods, but they've really, I think they've done what you're talking about, come up with a format to do elevated food, but do it at scale and do it well. Yeah. I think there's some real, um, operating advantages, um, when you scale like that and smart, creative and, um, smart, creative operators can take advantage of that. And if they have integrity with the product, it, it chain doesn't have to be a bad word for customers. Think about Tartine. We were talking about Tartine before we started recording, Mm. you know, they really went from their sort of teeny tiny shop in the mission in San Francisco. Now there are tartines in multiple cities and the quality is fantastic. Those pastries are great. The breads are great. They figured it out. Um, no, no, that, 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 that's a great example. And especially high end. Although I want to tie that to, I mean, certainly in Los Angeles, a tartine loaf of bread varies between if you're lucky, $12 to 15, which mm-hmm. for listeners in other part of the countries, they may, may have just fainted. Um, yeah. but, but and certainly you can taste the quality. Um, but I was curious before we go to break to just hear, you know, Eater, I'm assuming, has more of a dialogue than maybe other publications with their followers and readers. And what kind of feedback have you been hearing or seeing from readers just about the rising cost of, of eating out that you, you talked about a little bit before? Yeah, I think the, you know, eaters readers are dining lovers. They love going out. They have um, a pretty high knowledge base, I would say, about dining. And I think my hunch is that our our eaters' readers are experiencing what other food lovers are, which is, wow, this is expensive. And I know in my heart that ingredients are expensive and so is the labor. And I understand that costs need to be high. But that doesn't mean they're, it still means there has to be value for what you're paying. So I think our eater readers and really any diner that's paying these higher costs now still have high expectations of what the experience is um, to, to, again, justify the value, even if intellectually we know that things are super expensive right now. It's also things are super expensive for us too as consumers, you know, like mm, salaries aren't keeping up with inflation, groceries cost more, rents have gone up, all of that, you know, so it costs more for the restaurant to make the food. It also costs more for consumers to buy the food. Um, So I think readers do understand what's happening, but that's not an excuse to not deliver on the promise of the meal, if that makes sense. Yeah. And do do you think that that back to something you also said at the beginning of the show, do you think that there is a collective decision of we still want the good stuff, but we're going to accept that we're we're going to do it once a week rather than two to three times a week or uh, that people are just being more selective about? Yes. I don't know how conscious it is. And I think that would likely vary person to person, family to family on what their finances allow and their own routines and their skill in the kitchen, all of that. But yes, I think there's a one-to-one ratio between how expensive things are and how often people are treating themselves to going out. All right. After the break, we're going to be back with tips uh, for eating around the world with food writer Hillary Dixler Canavan. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking to food writer Hillary Dixler Canavan about the best places to eat around the globe. Now we're going to get into more of the good stuff and the fun stuff and talk start stop talking about the complex dynamics of the restaurant world and talk more about the fun part. So the fun part of um, traveling to eat. 
<laughs> exactly. So let's talk about this neat new uh, feature story out from Eater, Where to Eat in 2024, which is a very simple title for what is actually a pretty complex dining, travel, food trends piece. So but before we talk about the specifics, like even how did Eater approach this and what were the criteria that went into what, what is a fairly comprehensive article, but considering it's covering the entire planet is actually pretty concise. <laughs> Yeah, so this is not Eater's first time putting together where to eat in TK year. Um, and, you know, I know when we were chatting about this episode, you had asked, but like, what about New York or LA? Um, how do you choose the cities that get onto it? I think one thing that's true of all lists, whether it's a best new restaurants list or a best new chefs list, anything like that, you know, you're telling a story through what you choose. And I think the story that Eater aimed to tell with this package is not just like, here's the best of what's happening right now. It's also a look at like the, the inside track travelers and diners who are super in the know, this is where they're going to be paying attention this year. This is where the, the insiders are going to go this year. And did you guys start with like a team meeting where everyone just brainstormed and went around the room with your various journalists to be like, where do you keep hearing about over and over again that's surprising you? We started by meeting with the entire staff. We opened the submissions up to our entire Eater staff. So, and, you know, we have writers and editors across the country as well as contributors around the world. So um, the lead editor on it is Nick. He reached out to all of his contributors for our various international maps to get feedback from them, what they were seeing in their areas. Where were they excited to dine? Where were their chef and food contacts excited to dine this year? And then um, we left one slot open for readers to vote on which city they wanted to see um, on the list, of which American city they wanted to see on the list. And... I believe the statistic is that a full third of all votes went to Milwaukee and that's how Milwaukee won the, the, the reader vote. Which is just incredible. But as someone, I grew up in Kansas city, which is often, you know, kind of a dismissed place by people on the coast, but has its own unique culture and is a food town that's distinct and Mm -hmm. different than Milwaukee. I still love that. A, a, you know, a Midwestern city that is, is, you know, not necessarily a chic travel destination would have such a resurgence. So let's turn there. Let's talk about these U.S. recommendations. I mean, to yeah. me, it, it, it's a global list. So there's it, it's not dominated by American cities. And it's not even I would say most of the cities are not even like second order of the biggest tourist destination. So mm-hmm. how did Sacramento and Philly and, and Milwaukee beat out the big guys? So I think there's something really interesting that the U.S. cities have in common, right? So Milwaukee, Sacramento, and Philadelphia all have meaningfully lower costs of living than their nearest larger city. And so it's, it's, it's cheaper to own and operate a restaurant in Sacramento than it is in San Francisco, It's cheaper to live in Sacramento. Likewise, Milwaukee and Chicago. Likewise, Philadelphia and New York City. And I think what's revealing about that is in a city where a chef or an operator can afford to take a risk, that's when you can get the really exciting, innovative, new dining opportunities. Because if you can't afford to take the risk, you won't. You'll play it safe because that's how you'll stay in business. Um, and so I think that is like a really important, like pin, I would say like, as you're like mapping out why these cities, I think that's a huge factor is that these are cities in America where chefs can try stuff out. Um, no, I think that's a really astute point. I think what's interesting is you even see that in New York and LA, like we were talking before the show, we both live on the East Eastern side of Los Angeles and What's exciting to be East, because I was always a West Side person when I lived here before, is most of the exciting restaurants are opening farther and farther East. And I think that's a reflection of the chefs can't afford to live West because it's too expensive. For those who don't know Los Angeles, the farther closer you get to the water, the more expensive it gets. And um, on top of that, they want to live near their restaurants. In L.A., it's 
traffic. And so you're getting this kind of ge geographic shift in the center of exciting restaurants. And I think this, I don't know New York as well, but there's been this whole movement to Brooklyn, which, you know, did not, you know, 20, 30 years ago was not a chic place to live, but now is the in thing. But that's also because none of the chefs can afford to operate restaurants in Manhattan. Yes. A thousand percent. I would say that's I would say like the broad, uh, to me, when I look at them together, that's my main takeaway. Um, another, I think, element of this is like I was saying before about what story did, did Eater want to tell about the year? I think it's safe to assume that Eater readers already know that if you want great food, you can head to New York, you can head to Chicago, you can head to LA. I think if you assume that, then we wanted to uh, eater, I think, wanted to offer something with a bit more surprise, something that like, you know what, this wasn't on your list and it should be. Here's why. And I think that instinct um, is on display through each city on the list. Well, let's take one. I'll go back to my Midwestern fascination and bias. Let's talk about Milwaukee. So what mm -hmm. is it in Milwaukee, particularly that that met the editor's criteria and made you really pay attention. Obviously, that's kind of an overwhelming number from from readers. But so tell us more about what is going on in Milwaukee. I think one of the um, an, a line from the intro from our long, long time contributor from Milwaukee, Todd Lazarski, is that after four years, there's little left to prove. Um, and I think I love that about Milwaukee. So um, basically he was saying, you know, we had originally put Milwaukee on the where to eat list in 2020 and that published, I mean, right before the pandemic happened. Um, and so he sort of walks the reader through all of these different restaurants that have opened or have up leveled. There've been major awards nominations. Um, there's been expansions. And I think that confidence in the, that it's a dining, it's like a restaurant scene with confidence. They're not proving anything. They're already there. Top Chef is shooting um, season 21 in Milwaukee. This is now the second time in four years that they're hosting a major political convention that always brings in a ton of diners. Um, and I think that, yeah, like Milwaukee, it's got what anyone who loves dining is looking for a variety surprise, um, something for everyone, you know, a restaurant for every kind of occasion. And, um, again, it's like established, it's working. Do you, are you, well, I know it's hard to pick one as an example because it might show too much favoritism, but is there a restaurant that's featured or a couple restaurants that kind of exemplify this? Just, just to get more specific about even like what type of food, like, is it actually similar food that you find through the country? Is there something really specific to Milwaukee being in Wisconsin and the Northern Midwest or the ancestral heritage of people there? I mean, certainly there are some of that Wisconsin favorites. There are cheese curds and, and, you know, kind of more like meat and potatoes, Midwest vibes. And those are certainly gettable and gettable at a really high quality in Milwaukee. I also think Milwaukee famously has a lot of breweries and, you know, so if you're a traveler who loves beer, not surprising that you can do quite well for yourself in Milwaukee. Um, I think, when it comes to other restaurants, one of the, I think one of the poster child restaurants of like this iteration of Milwaukee is Odd Duck. It's been open since 2010. So it's, what does that make? That makes it like almost 13, 14 years old. So it's established, but I think that like they really were trailblazers with bringing that buzzy, higher end small plate vibe and that kind of proof of concept that Milwaukee diners would be interested in trying something new like that. Um, and their menu is very global. You know, there are Mexican influences, there are French influences. Um, so I think that restaurant is just a really great example of like, 
what's happening in cuisine nationwide is also happening in Milwaukee at a very high level. Thanks for that. So it's called Odd Duck? Mm-hmm. Got it. That sounds fitting for Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> And uh, and that's interesting. And congrats to them because any restaurant that's been open since 2010 and survived. I know it's doing it, something uh, right. That's quite a track record. So let, let's before we run out of time, we want to talk about international too. So mm-hmm. I thought you know these selections also mm-hmm. you know to your point d- defy expectations, but with good reason. So I was really curious how did places like Busan and Izmir mm-hmm. and Medellin beat out better known international dining destinations like Seoul or Istanbul or Mexico City? Yeah, of course, we were looking to surprise and delight with the list. That's how you keep people reading. Um, With Busan, um, I think this is a really great example of the process at work. Our contributor, one of our contributors in Korea, Maddie Kim, is actually a former eater intern. And this was a long, long time ago that Maddie worked in the office. And he's Korean. He went back to Korea and continued to contribute maps and guides to eater from Korea when Nick reached out to Maddie, Maddie's excitement about Busan, that comes with so much credibility. And that's so Eater's approach is to have people on the ground. We rely on journalists who spend their time in that area, usually are from, at least from the country that we're covering. We really try to avoid what we call parachute journalism, which as the name implies is, you know, a travel writer plopping down from Mm -hmm. somewhere else to tell, to tell you what to do. Um, Mm -hmm. so Maddie's excitement about Busan in and of itself is like the, is a great recommendation for the city. Here's a food expert who understands the eater reader telling, telling our readers, Hey, check this out. Got it. Now for you as both editor and then reader of what your correspondents were, were submitting, were there some places or trends that really stood out for you of like, Oh wow, that's really fascinating. Or gosh, I'm putting that on my list because it sounds delicious. Are there, you know, a few examples of things that stood out to you that you could share with us? For sure. I also want to make sure to give credit where it's due. I was not the lead edit on this project. That was Nick, um, man called Biddle who um, is a senior editor at Eater.com and oversees um, Eater's travel coverage. And so really this project is Nick's baby. Um, The city that I was most attached to in this process was Philadelphia, actually. I um, had such a good year of dining in Philly in 2023, such that on our 2023 Best New Restaurants list, which is the project that I led, um, I had two restaurants from Philly. Um, which had never happened before um, that two that Philly had ever had to um, land on the national list. And it was such an exciting year in Philly that I remember pinging Nick and being like, I really want, like, I really want Philly. I'm all about Philly right now. <laughs> um, so, and yeah, I'll be back in Philly in April for the chef's conference there. So I'm excited to go back for that. And then for my own travel, Yeah. I mean, I was as surprised as I think you are to see Sacramento on the list. Um, I, you know, as we've established, I live in LA, I live in Southern California. I haven't been, I've never been to Sacramento, you know? So that um, certainly has put it on my list because that's a very doable trip Mm -hmm. for me and my family Mm -hmm. um, that we can make a really fun road trip out of that. Um, and I don't think that would have been on my radar to do if not for this list, which I'm really grateful for. And are there any, um, was Busan the, the international standout for you or were there some other things from the international? I think list? it was for me because I am especially interested in, um, I, I like seafood, like Korean seafood is phenomenal. And while I've never been to Korea, that's like a, a through line through the cuisine that, and you've seen more and more of that happening here in America with restaurants, but yeah, that really caught my eye. I, that is a dream destination for me would be to travel to Korea. So that, yeah, I would say of, of the international cities, I think that one is probably the one I am most personally um, excited about. And again, in part also to shout out Maddie, like to have him contribute that. I mean, I'm also um, very excited about Osaka. I think um, for folks who have been to Japan before, um, Osaka was sort of known to people who had done their research as like, it's where 
Japan, it's like where you go to really dig in and eat. Um, Tokyo and Kyoto both have like phenomenal food scenes, but I think Osaka, um, I like the phrase that's coming to my mind is like, Osaka is where you go to glut, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so seeing it get the recognition on this list, I think is great. And I hope it inspires more people planning trips to Japan to include Osaka in their itinerary. And I'm very eager to go back to Japan. So yeah, I would love to, (laughs) I would also love to eat in in Osaka in 2024. Um, But TBD, (laughs) where I end up traveling. Well, that no, th- those are great shout outs. And obviously, uh, we encourage everyone to uh, check out the story because you can get all the details on eater.com. When we come back after the break, we'll hear Hillary's Julia moment. Let us know what you think of today's show. Send us an email or a voice memo to contact at juliachildfoundation.org. We'll be right back. When you flip anything, you really, you just have to have the courage of your convictions, particularly if it's sort of a loose mass like this. No, that didn't go very well. See, when I flipped it, I didn't, I didn't have the courage to do it the way I should have. But you can always pick it up, and if you're alone in the kitchen, who is going to see? From Julia's immortal words, we move into our last segment, which we call the Julia Moment. Here's when we ask our guests to share their favorite Julia memory, moment, or how she might have inspired them in their career. Okay, Hillary, what's your Julia Moment? Okay, I think I have two, That's possibly okay. three, but let's start with two. Um, my first Julia moment that's very clear to me, um, I am not ashamed to say that it is from the Julia and Julia movie, which came out when I was about one year out of college and like the height of the recession. And I had just moved back to New York after attempting to create my career in Seattle and I was working in theater at the time and the economy fell apart and everything was bad. And I remember I took myself to the movies. I saw that movie alone and it made me feel so much more excited about my journey and the restaurant work that I was doing. I've always loved food, um, but I hadn't fully embraced working in the restaurant that I was working in as a potential career yet because I was mourning what had happened to my arts career Mm. and Julia's obvious enthusiasm for cooking and for reinvention really inspired me at that time. And it made me remember watching like Julia and Jacques at home. Um, and it made me more excited to cook in my apartment, all of that stuff. It really did help me get out of that funk. And then my second Julia moment, I think, is happening right now. I, um, as you know, like I, I left my role at Eater after nearly 11 years. I am doing a reinvention. And one of the things that I most admire about Julia's career is that it wasn't on a specific timeline, that it is never, like, I feel like she really embodied that it is never too late to pursue your passion, to take a risk to try something new, to do something new, to challenge yourself. And I think as a, as a woman, as a professional woman, that is so inspiring. And it, she really does like make me feel fearless when I can channel her. Um, and I really mean it. (laughs) No, that's lovely. I think you've just very eloquently and very personally, uh, you know, describe what Julia embodies for a lot of people in, in her example, which was very authentic because she wasn't trying to do anything. She wasn't trying to become a life coach, but just by doing things her way, she's, she's kind of endured as one. Yeah. And truly like, you know, the Julia and Julia movie is not perfect, but it really helped me reconnect to a pre-existing love of food. And we all know it's because of the Julia plot line, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no comment, but I understand what you're saying. Exactly. Well, no, and that comes up a lot. It, 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 it's definitely, it, it's not flawless, but there's a lot of evergreen moments. And it brought, you know, I think from the foundation's perspective, the foundation was only a few years old when that movie came out. And that movie really had a catapulting effect of, of um, reminding people about Julia's legacy and, um, you know, I think it was really instrumental in in keeping Julia 
um, front of mind for a lot of people. So we're grateful to Nora Ephron for that. Yeah, for sure. And that movie like inspired me to read my life in France, which I had never read prior to that. You know what I mean? Like, I do think it was a really good entry point for, you know, the next generation of, of folks. Yes, we certainly encourage that. My life in France is, is for those who don't know, it's just a great read and there's much more in the book than was, was in the movie. So we thank you for the shout out and recommendation. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks everyone for listening. If you want, as I said before, check out Eater's global restaurant recommendations. You can go to eater.com, click on travel, and then where to eat in 2024, or you can just Google that. Um, for more from Hillary, it's at Hillary Dixler Canavan on Instagram. And find more episodes of Inside Julia's Kitchen on juliachildfoundation.org, heritageradionetwork.org, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please follow at Julia Child on Facebook, at Julia Child Foundation on Instagram and threads for all our latest news and events. I'm at T. Shulkin on Instagram and threads. The Julia Child audio clip from The French Chef is used with permission from our friends at GBH. Thanks to my co-producer at the foundation, Lauren Salkeld, and our sound engineer is Liam Werner. Our theme song is New French Horn by Novi Veltorni. We look forward to bringing you back into the foundation's world next time on Inside Julia's Kitchen. Inside Julia's Kitchen is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.